Okay, welcome everyone. A few minutes for people to get in out of the waiting room here. Um, but welcome to our third and final installment of NCSL's virtual meeting series on policing policy hosted by the Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety here at NCSL. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amber Widry, and I'm joined today by several of my colleagues from NCSL's Criminal Justice Program, both in DC and Denver. We are also joined today by Colorado State Representative Leslie Herod and Colorado State Representative Matthew Soper. During our time today, we will focus on state law enforcement initiatives, but I also want to encourage you to go back and watch the earlier recordings of the previous two meetings. Um, if you're interested, there's more information there on use of force and qualified immunity federal U.S. Supreme Court case law um, and also federal legislative efforts as well. So I'll be kicking off today's meeting with a brief overview of recent legislative trends and legislation that we've seen uh, since the events in May. And then I'll be moderating a discussion with representatives Herod and Soper about the recent actions in Colorado. But before we get to that, I want to encourage everyone to submit questions that you may have as you go along in the chat box. My colleague Allison Lawrence will be monitoring the chat box and we'll relay those questions at the end of our discussion where we have some time for that. NCSL staff will also be adding relevant resource links to the chat box as we go, or you can find all of those resources, including the slide deck from today's presentation um, on the meeting webpage for later reference. Okay. Just pause right there and I will get started. So launching my presentation here, two seconds for me to get the tech going. The first thing I wanted to highlight for you today is NCSL's new policing legislation database. We launched the database not quite a month ago and it contains policing legislation that has been introduced in state legislatures across the nation since May 25th of 2020. The status of bills in the database is updated daily and new legislation is added to the database as it is identified by staff, which is at least weekly at this point. There's a link to the database in the chat box and you will also be able to access it in the resources after this meeting. Um, you can tell when new legislation is added to the database because there's a date stamp at the top of the page. You can search this new database by keyword, state, author, bill number, bill status, or by topic. I highlight topics specifically, as you'll see on the left-hand side of the image. These topics were uh, created and curated by NCSL staff, and we manually sort legislation on a weekly basis into those topics. Below the database module on the web page, you'll also see a definition of each topic, which we modify as we sort additional legislation into the database. So on to what states have been focusing on in recent weeks. As of the end of last week, 27 states and Washington DC had introduced 339 bills. 35 of those have now been enacted and seven are awaiting executive action. 181 of those pieces of legislation are still pending in legislatures. What is noticeable about these numbers is the proportion of states that have been able to introduce legislation since May 25th. Without COVID-19 related delays and recesses, only 17 states would have been in session after the events on May 25th. In addition to the delayed sessions, special legislative sessions have also been convened to address COVID-19, providing another opportunity in some states for policing issues to be raised. And finally, in some states like Oregon and Minnesota that have called special sessions to address COVID-19 issues, um, those special sessions have also had specific intent to address policing issues alongside COVID-19 issues. Of the 339 introduced bills that I mentioned on the last slide, 35 of those have now been enacted. Those actions represent the actions of 15 state legislative bodies and also the Washington DC Council. On this slide, you'll see a listing of the topics that have been addressed by those enactments, but I wanted to just briefly give you some more detail about what states have been addressing more specifically. 
enacted uh, recent enactments have addressed uh, most broadly something related to police oversight or data collection and reporting. To give a few examples, Rhode Island and Louisiana each created new task forces on policing and the Oregon legislature has created a new joint legislative committee that will fo focus exclusively on policing issues going forward. Other enactments have focused on gathering and making available data particularly on officer use of force and information on police contacts or stops with an emphasis on that data being publicly available. We've also seen a focus on the use of force and this has included changing statutory standards for physical force and for deadly force, restricting the use of specific kinds of force, including chokeholds, or restricting when less lethal means of force should be used or encouraging the use of less lethal means of force. Related to this, states have also created statutory duties to intervene in excessive force situations and also created duties to report incidents of excessive force. Use of force state actions um, have also focused on creating frameworks for independent state level investigation and also independent state level prosecution for police involved incidents. In Colorado, Delaware, and Iowa, these changes have involving involved empowering specifically the state attorney general to take action. States have also provided stronger guidance for required training, both annual training and training required for initial officer certification. De-escalation training and training on new standards has been mandated in some states, and Iowa's new law also requires annual bias prevention training in addition to de-escalation training. There has also been guidance as to what types of serious misconduct would require that an officer in a state be decertified. Greater access to decertification and disciplinary records has also been of interest, with some states passing provisions to increase transparency. To provide a few examples of this, the new New Jersey enactment requires law enforcement agencies to share internal affairs records and personnel files with other law enforcement agencies in the state. The New York law repealed a provision that authorized confidentiality for personnel records of law enforcement officers, and Oregon's new enactment required the creation of a public statewide database of police officer discipline records. And this has also partially already been implemented with the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, just recently launching a new database with historical data that goes back to 1971. Other issues that have received attention include requiring and regulating the use of body cameras and also limiting immunity or addressing other state level protections for officers who act in bad faith or who've committed criminal offenses during the course of their duty. Finally, states remain interested in expanding alternatives to arrest and deflection programs that reduce justice system contact for appropriate individuals. The other notable thing that I wanted to highlight today is the speed at which some of these new enactments have made their way through legislative chambers. To give a particularly notable example of this, Iowa House Bill 2647 was passed unanimously in both chambers of the House in just two days. It was shortly thereafter signed by the governor. I also want to highlight that in addition to the 339 bills that you'll find in the database, you will also see that we're tracking executive orders. Three other statewide bodies have been created by executive order. And the other notable thing that I wanted to point out on this slide is that the Connecticut order uh, is notable because it actually makes substantive changes that address use of force, community engagement, demilitarization of the police, and also police use of body cameras. I'll leave my overview there for now, but I also wanted to highlight that what I focused on today were state actions from just the past six weeks. For additional information looking back on what states have done in recent years on policing policy, there are additional resources on the meeting webpage and that have been added to the chat box. And the slides there. And with that, I would like to turn to today's other speakers, and I want to thank them for joining us today. For some quick background for our audience, Representative Leslie Harrod was initially elected in 2016 to the Colorado House of Representatives. She currently serves as the chair of the Finance Committee, the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, and also serves on the Committee of Legal Services. She is also the chair for the Colorado Black Democratic Legislative Caucus. 
We also have with us today Representative Matthew Soper, who was first elected in 2018 to the Colorado House of Representatives and serves on the Judiciary, Legal Services, and Health and Insurance Committees. So I first want to highlight that Colorado was one of the first states to enact legislation following the death of George Floyd. Senate Bill 217 is also recognized as a notable national example of bipartisan cooperation. Our audience today will want to hear about the politics of how Senate Bill 217 was enacted. But first, Rep. Herod, Representative Herod, I want to ask you as the sponsor of that legislation, could you please describe for us um, a little bit more about Senate Bill 217 and what that bill accomplishes? Whoops. Has she sure. left? I, no, can, oh, you, would you, can you hear me OK? We can. OK, great. Um, I was going to join by my phone as well because I'm having some issues with the internet here. Um, but let me just see if this will work. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm State Representative Leslie Herod. Um, I am here in Colorado. So proud to be the prime sponsor of uh, Senate Bill 217, the Law Enforcement Accountability and Integrity Act. Um, we were able to um, because of COVID, as you mentioned, Amber, and I thought your, your slides were very fascinating because I do believe that a lot of these legislatures are in session right now or were in session during this time so that we could be responsive to the calls from the community for change around policing. So days after the protest started, Colorado was able to introduce um, and then within three weeks, I think 16 days pass, um, sweeping and comprehensive policing reform across the state. Um, Amber, did you want me to go into the, the components of the bill or just uh, kind of the overview? Yeah, if you could highlight a few of the components, I think we have time for that and it would be of interest. Great. So our bill, um, we are the first state in the nation to end qualified immunity for law enforcement um, uh, through statute. So we ended qualified immunity and we actually have a personal liability for law enforcement officers up to $25,000 for officers who act in bad faith um, and violate someone's constitutional rights. Um, that's very important uh, because we believe that there needs to be personal liability and responsibility um, for an individual, uh, individual's actions when they act in bad faith. Additionally, we have a duty to intervene that's tied into uh, the civil penalties around the qualified immunity and criminal penalties for those who, who fail to intervene. Um, you, the lowest level offense you will get is a um, class one misdemeanor, which is six months in jail. Um, but you could also be charged with a higher crime um, if you assisted, aided, or um, supported an officer in any way in uh, use of force. We also reined in use of force. We banned chokeholds, banned fleeing felon. We also limited um, when force can be used and when less lethal means of force will be used. Additionally, we required body cameras to every, um, for every uh, police department across the state of Colorado um, by 2023. And we required the release of the body camera footage within 21 days in most circumstances and 45 days tops um, to the family and then publicly when, uh, when a use, use of force incident has occurred. Um, uh, there's a lot of other provisions in the bill, specifically around data collection, which are really important. Even every time you unholster your weapon, you must report that and who you point the weapon at, um, or where you, uh, wh why, who was it at the scene when you, um, when you pulled out that weapon. That's really important. It was actually brought to us by the DAs um, because they thought that that provision was going to be very important in just figuring out where the issues lie. We have pattern and practice investigations in our bill as well. And I think most importantly, um, we followed Connecticut's lead in saying that if you are a law enforcement and you have excessive use of force, um, you actually will no longer be able to work as a law enforcement officer in Colorado again. Your post-certification peace officer standards and training certification will be removed, revoked. Um, and uh, also those officers who failed to intervene if they were um, a party to the uh, excessive use of force will also have their um, peace officer certification revoked and will not be able to be a law enforcement officer again. You will also be added into a public database, which is extremely important so that other states and the community knows um, if you're shopping around from department to department or maybe even going into a private security company and harming someone there. 
So our goal is to ensure that law enforcement officers who are good officers um, should be fine with this law. But the ones who are, who are bad, who have these patterns of, of mistreatment of the community, patterns of abuse and violence, um, that they're no longer able to operate um, on the police force, not only in a place that I represent, Denver, but throughout the state of Colorado, and hopefully other states will be required to look in that database as well. Um, the other thing, one thing that we did not do was we did not um, add in the special investigation unit. We are working on that right now, um, just to figure out how we wanna have an independent investigation arm. We already have independent investigation requirements in Colorado, um, but we're finding that they're just not effective enough. And so there is more work that needs to be done there. I'm proud to say that Colorado passed this bill with bipartisan support, with only two no votes in the Senate. Um, and I believe it was 11 no votes in the House, and perhaps Representative Soper can speak to that. Um, but we had strong, strong support. Um, and actually, one legislator reported that she had heard from 38,000 constituents. 38,000 wow. constituents. And she doesn't represent Denver. Um, on this bill and on some of the, the struggles that Colorado has had around use of force. So people care about this issue. It's not a partisan issue. Policing should not be partisan, um, but it is one that if we work together, we can actually make meaningful reform right now. Thank you for that, Representative Herod. Um, Representative Soper, I wanted to now turn to you. You had previously introduced legislation that addressed qualified immunity earlier in the session prior to the COVID-19 related recess. Could you please give us a little bit more information about your interest in that topic initially and how that ended up becoming ultimately a part of Senate Bill 217? Absolutely. And thank you, Amber, uh, for having myself and Representative Herrick here. You know, I just wanted to lay the groundwork a little bit. So it was House Bill 1287, and it would have removed qualified immunities for all government actors and basically implemented a state version of the federal section 1983. And part of the uh, thinking there is that there's oftentimes when you have at the state level, whether it's law enforcement or quite frankly, you could have a local town council that are explicitly violating constitutional rights under the state constitution of Colorado citizens, and it could be under the state constitution of any other state. But we wanted to be able to have some sort of a legal remedy to still make our constitution mean something and not necessarily have government actors running rogue or to at least serve as a warning because there's nothing like getting sued than to change your behavior. And it tends to change the behavior of a, a greater amount of people. What I discovered very quickly is that anytime you want to have large sweeping reform, you need to be prepared for a lot of backlash. And I perhaps wasn't fully prepared for the fact that uh, pretty much every single DA and police chief and county sheriff and city council member and county commissioner and uh, even actually all of our state elected officials were all in opposition to my bill. Now, that's not to say I didn't have a lot of great support. I mean, I had a lot of people that supported it. Uh, I know Representative Herod was uh, the one who was in support of it. We uh, had people on board uh, from the ACLU to Cato. Uh, so we had uh, Americans for Prosperity. I mean, we, we definitely had the balancing of stakeholders, but ultimately that was not enough to really overcome the opposition. And the opposition was, was definitely fierce. So that's uh, when I, I asked to have the bill postponed indefinitely uh, with the idea that we would spend the summer or the interim time uh, working on some of the language uh, to really try to bring them around. And then a few days later, we had COVID-19 start. And that's when the governor on March 10th declared a state of emergency. And by the end of that week, the entire General Assembly was back home in their districts and the whole world basically changed. I mean, I don't need to tell you how that happened. But at that point in time, I couldn't have thrown the issue of qualified immunity from one side of the hallway to the other without it being shot down. And then we come back in the session for a, uh, about a three and a, three and a half week long session uh, to finish our business past the state budget. We had to cut like three and a half billion dollars. And Representative Herod um, had introduced um, sweeping law enforcement reform. And one thing that got included was the elements of qualified immunity from the bill I was working on. 
And timing is everything in politics to where uh, she was able to take that and actually get it passed and accomplished in a year when I felt like that would have been impossible. Uh, so certainly a lot of credit there. It, um, and, and managed to do so with- Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome, Representative Herod. Uh, it, and I just want to um, lay a little bit more of the, of the background because you know, there's nothing like having a sense of urgency to bring a lot of the stakeholders back to the table and to offer real solutions. And that's probably not what existed in March, but fast forward to the last day of May, 1st of June, the sense of urgency was there. So uh, there were things like uh, the $25,000 um, cap as far as what would actually come out of the law enforcement officers on bank account. Now it doesn't apply to all government employees, only uh, post-certified law enforcement members, but there were uh, some additional constraining uh, vehicles such as bad faith and the violation of state constitutional principles. So, so that's how we kind of got here. It's pretty a remarkable story, really. I mean, this will be written about uh, for years to come in the annals of history. Thank you for that, Representative. Uh, I think both of you have mentioned sort of the unique circumstances that resulted in the passage of Senate Bill 217, and in particular, uh, the bipartisan effort. Representative Herod, you mentioned some of that. Uh, today, we have an audience of other lawmakers and legislative staff from other states who would be interested to learn what challenges you faced and how you built that broad bipartisan consensus across the aisle for Senate Bill 217. Sure. You know, I think it was interesting because um, I work well with members on both sides of the aisle. Um, one thing that I learned about criminal justice reform and also taking a cue from NCSL is that when you talk about criminal justice reform, um, there is an interesting uh, team that can, that can be built, coalition, that includes liberals and libertarians, right? Um, it includes Democrats and Republicans and even rural Republicans um, who really wanna to come together to work on these issues directly because they directly affect their communities. Um, and so we're not so different, not only in the challenges, but in our solutions to those challenges. And so I believe it's just really important to have the conversation. But because of the way COVID had limited our session, um, we had to do things very differently. And I think that caught people a little bit off guard. For instance, um, I'm, I drafted and led the bill and asked for, you know, the late bill approval and you all know how that goes with leadership and all of that stuff. But we ended up introducing the bill in the Senate um, because the House was dealing with the budget. Um, and so we introduced it uh, with the Senate president as the co-prime sponsor um, and he introduced it in the Senate. In the initial version, um, we didn't do a lot of behind the scenes negotiations, meaning we didn't, we wanted to make sure that everything was out in the public. So all of the amendments that were offered, um, I would, wouldn't say all, but the majority of the amendments that were offered were offered after the bill was introduced. Because we believed it was so important that especially law enforcement officers were coming to the table and speaking specifically to why they don't want something in a bill. And it was much harder for them to say, we don't want to ban chokeholds across the state, you know, or fleeing felon across the state um, if you're doing that publicly. Uh, similar to Representative Soper, I had a bill that addressed, addressed fleeing felon and chokeholds uh, at the beginning of session. And we did not have enough support to get that introduced. So it really did take the power of the people and this moment in time to get this to, to pass. Um, but once we introduced the bill, it was so important that we were open to negotiation. That $25,000 threshold, let me tell you, it was much higher at the start of the bill. So if you read the first draft of the bill, it does look different. Um, and in some ways that was by design because I wanted to make sure that the community knew that we were fighting for something that would make real change in our communities. But they also needed to hear what the middle ground was, right? And we needed to bring everyone to the table. And that's what we did. At the end of the day, we had no public opposition from law enforcement agencies or the, I would say the organized law enforcement lobby by the time the bill was passed. I think that is very important and I feel like it's kind of unique. So I don't know if we have any of my friends on the call from Massachusetts, but they just passed 
um, their Senate bill at what, 4 a.m. on Monday. And I'm so proud of the work that you all did. And I gotta tell you, I got a call from Massachusetts and it was like, hey, can you help us on this bill? We need you to call some folks. You need to you know, talk strategy, help me understand this, right? And so I made the calls, but I was like, listen, we're Denver, we're Colorado. There are no movies and TV shows about Denver cops. You know what I mean? But there are tons about the Boston PD. I don't know how the heck you're gonna, there's whole TV shows, like everyone loves to see them. I don't know what you're gonna do, but this is the right policy, you know? And I was just so proud to see that pass through the Senate because folks agreed that it is the right policy. And I do believe that when you bring law enforcement um, to the table, especially the chiefs of police and even some of the sheriffs, depending on how your county is working, they want these bills too. They want this change too. They might not publicly be able to say it, but they can help negotiate the bill into a place that's completely workable and that can be implemented in a way that keeps our public safe. Um, so it is important to have bipartisan support, even though we have the majority in the House and the Senate, and I had the support from the governor upon introduction, we wanted to make sure that we also had support from uh, our other colleagues across the aisle so that Coloradans understood that this wasn't just about a party. It was really about what's best for our state. And Amber, I'd like to chime in just a little bit more to what sure. my colleague Representative Herod was saying. I think something else was kind of unique about 217, and that's the fact that the organized law enforcement lobby, the sheriffs, the police chiefs, the DAs, they didn't immediately go to all out opposition. And that's really important because they were in a very uh, amendable position from the get go. And I know, you know most of the people on this call are also fellow state lawmakers. And think about other bills you've worked on. If a major group says they're in opposition, what do you naturally do? Well, you stop talking to them because if you've counted votes and you don't need their support, why are you bothering talking to them? And I think that, you know, at least with this bill, it was just a little bit different dynamics because you actually had the lobby understand that they couldn't just sit back and um, throw rocks at the bill Instead, they needed to be a very active participant in actually working with the sponsors and the sponsors wanted to work with them. I mean, it was, it was both ways around. And, and that's what I observed uh, because it was just, um, you know, it was very uh, unique, it was very delicate, but um, uh, we got through. And as Representative Herod said, you know, this ended up being a very good bipartisan bill. Great, thank you for that. The next thing I wanted to ask is uh, what advice either of you would have for other lawmakers or legislative staff who are on the line today uh, looking to introduce legislation in 2021 or perhaps currently working on legislation um, in their states right now? Sure, I'll say um, start big. Do not start small because your bill will obviously, as you all know as legislators, um, probably get smaller. Um, I am a firm believer in running the bill as one solid bill, um, because if we had run multiple bills, and I think my colleague might agree with me, um, it would have been much easier to oppose things like the qualified immunity. Um, it would have been much easier to oppose certain provisions. And so, um, uh, so I would say definitely think about running packages and make sure that every member in your caucus has a role to play. What I thought was so fascinating and, you know, let me just say, I'm the first black queer legislator in Colorado. <laughs> um, so for me, it was going out to protest. It's like my community, like I'm all good. I'm, I, you know, I would run a bill and then I would run outside and go hang out in the protest, right? Um, but for a lot of legislators, they had never even spoke at a protest or a rally. Um, they didn't know if it was their role to say something right now, especially um, the white legislators. Uh, they didn't know that it was appropriate for them to speak up and, and, and be an ally in the moment. Um, even Republican um, lawmakers. And I think that what's so important is for folks to understand that we all have a role um, in passing police reform, not just the Judiciary Caucus, not just the typical members, but all of us. And so if you're lead on one of these bills, figure out ways to bring in members of your caucuses that, that would never speak on these kind of issues because we're in an interesting time when a lot more people care or wanna do something than we even realize. So I would just suggest that. But then I would say that it was also so, so, so important to do that. And I didn't even know at first why, but 
when you're talking about then figuring out the money piece, right? All of a sudden you have joint budget committee members who are stepping up for the bill and showing up in ways that, you know, I couldn't even fathom, you know, or you have the public health members stepping up and talking about the public health crisis. And so um, it's just really important that this this bill is led through coalition and that you figure out ways to engage the community every step of the way because they are a force and they're ready to get to work. So um, yeah, that, that's what I would say on the bill. And I would add to that and I would say that the larger the bill, the more you have to have broad coalitions, whether you need them or not. Because if you're going to have large sweeping changes in state law, you need to be able to, at the end of the day, say that you had law enforcement as a key player. You had uh, the opposition party as a key player. That that everyone had a part to play. So I'd agree with the representative Herod on that. I will say that that, that personally, um, you know, I I'm I'm not necessarily a big fan of um, putting a lot of bills together and trying to do one big package. But I understand why it was done here, and I know that uh, from a strategy point of view, uh, this was. The right time. I mean, I don't think we would have gotten these individual components like qualified immunity um, passed as a standalone bill. And I can tell you that from having ran the standalone bill. <laughs> so uh, you, you certainly have to weigh the strategy versus what you personally believe as far as how to get it done. And, and that'll be just something that's very unique based on state law and the individual legislators. But certainly, you know, you need legislators who are in safe seats who are willing to uh, not be afraid of anyone or anything uh, actually uh, dropping the legislation and getting it going. Thanks for that. And I see we have a question here from Representative Eric Hutchings. So I'm actually just going to ask you to unmute. And if you want to go ahead and ask your question directly. Oh, that's cool. Thanks. Hey, uh, congratulations, you guys. Good work. Um, super difficult subject. But I had a question. I'm not sure which one to address it to. Representative Herrick, probably to you. On the um, qualified immunity adjustments that you did, um, who represents, so if, if a lawsuit and maybe uh, Representative Soper to you as well on how you are running your bill, if a lawsuit were to be filed, um, who at that point, uh, or if it, even if it's criminal charges, who represents the individual? Who represents either the officer or the state employee? And if they lose, um, is there, uh, does it go to the state? Does the state pay the penalty? Is the state on the hook for any of that in either one of your bills? Or does it just go to them personally? Can you guys help with some details on that? You know, I'll let Matt start since he's the attorney on the call. Oh, oh thank you very much. Uh, you're too kind. So um, I'll, I'll first talk about my bill because I, I think 1287 and 217 are the same on this point. And that would be that it's presumed that the law enforcement agency would cover the attorney's fees for the officer. And then if, uh, let's say, the officer prevails, then they would need to prove that the lawsuit was brought frivolously to be able to be recompensated for the attorney's fees. So it's exactly like Section 1983 at the federal level. And this is more relying on standard practice rather than necessarily codifying every single element of Section 1983 in practice in the state law. But what would happen in Colorado is, let's say, an officer, um, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, th th think of your best uh, fact pattern. You know, someone's shot. Um, they shouldn't have been shot. They were innocent. The officers uh, sued civilly. And in that case, the officer, um, in theory, is paying their own legal expenses, but it's actually the agency that's uh, compensating that. So they're actually paying the attorneys. And then let's say the officer is found guilty, uh, civilly here, then it would be a maximum of $25,000 in, in, in 217. My bill didn't have a cap. So in 217, it'd be a maximum of $25,000 that the officer would have to come up with out of his or her own assets, and then the rest would be indemnified by the agency. Okay, that's a very helpful so thing. The, 
so we do in the bill we are requiring indemnification um and so it's actually interesting because it's it's been part of i would say um uh, black history black lexicon for generations now where they talk about officers needing to have their own type of insurance um similar to doctors my brother's a doctor um because you know insurance companies and if you believe in free market and all of that right um can help to determine if that officer is a higher liability or lower liability right or even if that department is a higher liability and so um we are requiring um you know the indemnification however if you are found in bad faith, you have to pay that $25,000 out of your pocket. Now, the number, like I said, was initially much higher um, when we started. I believe it might have been 250, I think it was 100,000, somewhere in there. Um, we brought that down. But the reason why we have that, or 5% of the total settlement, right? The reason why we didn't say the officer is completely obviously liable is because, and responsible personally, is because they'll file for bankruptcy. And then that victim will never be able to, comp to, to get compensation. Right. But there has been a lot of talk about instead of um, the personal liability, um, taking out from their pensions, right, taking away from the officer pension fund and providing that shared liability through the officers through that pension fund. Instead, we went the culture change route with the duty to intervene and some of the other components about, you know, how we're going to get officers to share the responsibility to ensuring that there's no officers on their force acting in bad faith. But if there is an officer who acts in bad faith, they are personally re responsible for that $25,000 or 5% of the entire settlement. Um, that is intentional um, because basically the public and the community wants some type of personal stake in the game, similar to other areas. Um, if you, you know, a doctor and you um, intentionally harm a child, for instance, there are civil and criminal penalties that you can face, you know? This is the same way in this law. Um, and quite frankly, it's already in place in Colorado. Um, we haven't seen a case yet that has, that has challenged um, any of these issues, but I do think it's the right way forward. Um, and, and eventually we might wanna change that number here and there, but I do think that's a personal liability that's high enough um, that we can, we can ensure that officers, you know, are thinking before they do something intentionally against the law. And did you, Representative Harrod, did you put a um, does it have to be use of force related? Can it be, uh, you know, pulled over an individual inappropriately? Can it be um, too many direct contacts with an, uh, that? Is there, is there like a, a limit on felony or misdemeanor or a certain type? Or is it just universal across all of their work scope? So for this section, it is tied to uh, very closely to Representative Soper's previous bill. So it is constitutional violations. Um, you have to you have to intentionally and in bad faith violate someone's constitutional rights in Colorado. Um, and so it does not include dis disciplinary actions. So if it's something internal that's going on, um, an email, you know, things like that that are happening, um, that would not be included. Okay. And do you guys have a definition of that that you could share with us as far as what is, I'm assuming you're talking um, like Bill of Rights type of rights or are there constitutional rights, civil rights is defined in the Colorado Constitution? Because that's, um, it's very useful, but it's pretty broad. And I'm assuming in order for that to be able to be taken to court, it's got to be somewhat defined somewhere. I, that'd be super helpful, I think, to be able to uh, utilize that ourselves. And I, I can answer that, Eric. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's tied to the um, Colorado Constitution, the Colorado Bill of Rights. So it would need to be a violation that's in the Colorado Bill of Rights. Okay. Uh, so for example, not, um, not everything that's in the Bill of Rights would be actionable either. Like for example, believe it or not, we actually have a section that says English is Colorado's official language. Well, if a, um, let's say a law enforcement officer is writing in Spanish, you know, are they violating the Constitution? No, because it has to be something that's tied to the individual and the person. And so just because it's tied to the Bill of Rights doesn't mean that every element of the Bill of Rights is actionable. It would have to be um, you know, something like, um, like false imprisonment or um, um, you know, denying um, liberty to a citizen. Did, did anybody bring up things like, we've had a lot of heat lately on asset forfeiture. Um, oh, that's like our that favorite where, one. That's our yeah. favorite topic. Well, and, and I guess my question is, um, 
it, I, I'll have to look and thank you, by the way, for the, for the, I made a note to look for Colorado's Bill of Rights and get into that, but um, that could be a, a very broad scope of the work that an officer does. And had, did anybody bring up their concern about there just being um, thousands of new lawsuits filed uh, every year in Colorado? I'm, I'm sure they did. I'm just imagining in my head what I would hear. Um, but anyway, how did you how did you approach that? The idea that it's just going to be because um, everybody. I, I mean, it's. I, I think there's a lot of people that don't clearly understand sometimes what their constitutional rights actually are as defined by law and as defensible in a court of law. Um, how did you guys get around that? How did you how did you approach that? Sure, and I'll 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 jump in here at first, and then Representative Ferret might want to chime in also. Well, we look first to other states. I mean, that's where NCSL is incredibly valuable, gives us connections. So we looked to New York and California, and they had passed uh, similar uh, qualified immunity laws. And what we had been able to observe from those two states is that plaintiffs would choose to go the federal Section 1983 route or the state law route. You didn't see them going both routes. So if you're going to get sued as, in, and I mean, we're using law enforcement here, but in both of those states, it actually was a lot broader than that. Then you would have said, oh, well, there's gonna be thousands of new lawsuits. Well, that also means that the government entities have to admit that they're violating citizens' constitutional rights thousands of times every single year, every single day. And that's just not the case at all. I mean, there's always going to be some bad actors and there's gonna be some bad actions that occur but it's not like things that couldn't have been actionable under 1983 are all of a sudden now actionable under the state constitution. I mean, there might be additional things. As I mentioned, every state has some quirky things in their constitution and if it's tied to the Bill of Rights. But mainly what you're trying to do is uh, have your day in court and to be able to seek justice. And, it, and I mean, part, part of the frustration is our US Supreme Court now, because really Section 1983 should have stood the test of time, and really it's just the failing of that. And so when our court said in um, uh, Malley against Briggs that it needs to be clearly established uh, principle of law, and that the officer, you know, I'll just uh, read this one line to you, uh, that the officer had to have objective good faith, and that the standard is whether a reasonably trained officer with a reasonable knowledge that the law prohibits X, Y, and Z would have known that the challenged action would have been in violation of the constitution. Well, you know, that sounds really nice, but what that actually did is it really made 1983 to where the only time a plaintiff could have actually been successful is if their fact pattern exactly matched one that had already been successful in the past. And that's why you're seeing a lot of states say, you know, when, when Congress first passed this section um, during Reconstruction right after the Civil War, it, you know, it was meant to actually allow citizens to have a remedy for constitutional violations. It wasn't for the Supreme Court to put up these incredibly high hurdles. And so that's why you're seeing states like Colorado play around with, okay, we're our own state. We should be able to write our own laws to give effect to uh, uh, the Constitution. Yeah, and I, I see, um, and I'm sorry, Eric, where are you from? Is it Utah? I know we were at a conference together. I just can't remember what Utah, state yeah. you're from. Utah, okay, good to see you. Um, uh, so I see also a question from, uh, from uh, Rep Cassidy, um, hi friend, uh, and it's about the cost as well. So I'll, I'll just tie them together. Um, we did hear folks concerned about a lot of frivolous cases and all of that. We, we just don't believe that that's going to materialize. Um, there are already a lot more cases around police brutality um, in our cities than we even realize. So what was interesting was the Municipal League and the uh, Colorado Counties Incorporated kind of backed out from being very vocal about the conversation when we asked the first question, which was, please give us a reporting of the um, payouts for excessive use of force or violation of the constitution over the last, you know, illegal search and seizure, those kind of things over the last five years. And Colorado has some of the highest payouts in the nation. 
Um, and so even just looking at Denver's numbers, it gives cre credence to say that our bill actually save you money because those bad officers ideally will leave the force, but they'll also be held accountable. Um, and, you'll have, and you'll have officers who also with the duty to intervene step in and create a new culture of policing in our communities so that you're actually decreasing the cases and decreasing the payouts um, in your city and across the state. And so ask for those numbers. If you don't have them for your county even, get them, you know, and then start to look at others. And PS, the ones who don't have a lot of issues, they are really not gonna be problematic. And some of them might even already have a lot of these policies on the books, but there's not gonna be a change really for them. It's gonna happen in the places where there are excessive use of force, where you do see issues come up. And it doesn't change the amount of the settlement, but it does change the officer's liability when they act in good faith. Representative Cassidy, did that address your question or did you wanna jump in there too? No, that's great. I appreciate it. I just think that that as this rolls, more locals are getting up in arms, so it's really helpful to have ways to talk about it. So thank you, Representative Harrod. I appreciate that. Awesome. And then I think next we have uh, Jeff Guidry. Did you have a question that you wanted to pose to our panel here? Thanks. Not. I can go back and read his question that he submitted. Sorry, just scrolling through the chat here. Actually, while you're scrolling through that, Amber, yep. uh, uh, there's one thing I might add to what we were just talking about. And one really important thing with 217 that was a vast improvement from uh, the bill I ran earlier in the session, and it really is the $25,000 cap. Because one thing we heard a lot from the law enforcement community was this is going to bankrupt um, the agency. Uh, I, mean, I mean, not that they're not still going to have the indemnification and attorney's fees and things like that involved, but they worried it would have a chilling effect on who would become police officers and that there would just be this mass exodus from being a police officer. And that what $25,000 says is, you know, you you could actually take out an insurance policy if you're really that worried that would cover the $25,000. And it, you know, I felt it, it definitely shifted the conversation dramatically. And that was something that we weren't quite able to do earlier in the session when it was easier for the stakeholders to kill the bill rather than actually negotiate uh, what, what could be done. Thanks for that. I also finally found the question. Uh, did you add any enforcement mechanisms for any reporting requirements? And if so, what kind? So um, this is not a this is not a May report. It's a it's a shall. So they have to. But then we also did add in the pattern and practice piece. I think that's really important. That gives the attorney general the ability to go in and to um, investigate or even um, I mean, take over when necessary uh, departments that um, have have pattern practice issues. Um, we also have a uh, post certification and finally funding. Um, funding is tied to the to the um, data collection. Um, and so actually I have a meeting with the post board, I believe next week or week after that to really go through how they're going to promulgate their rules to enforce this. Um, but it is it is tied to the, I think the most important part is the money. Um, for the reporting. And, and all of the reporting is um, reporting into a public database. Um, the reporting, the collection has to start happening in 2022. So again, we did give some credence to the fact that some folks are in, you know, tough to all of us are in tough times with COVID. Um, and, you know, asking folks to build a database right now with, with no money. And by the way, we gave no money. There's no increase in funding in this bill. Um, was going to be really tough for people. But what we did do was we put out for 2022, um, and I think that's really important. So uh, we have some time to tweak some of that language, but I don't know that we will need to, uh, but it is tied to the AG being able to, um, and the funding piece, the money. Thank you. I have another question here from Mike Queensland in Wisconsin. Does the Colorado prohibition on law enforcement officers using chokeholds have an exception for situations when a law enforcement officer is acting in self-defense? And does the chokehold ban also cover carotid holds um, or holds that reduce blood flow, but not airflow? 
It does include karate as well. There is no exemption for self-defense. Um, there are other uh, provisions in our change of the entire use of force statute um, that does deal with self-defense, um, but the chokehold is, is, is not, the, not the appropriate method for that. Um, so that is, that is defined in the bill um, that I think you have here in, in the comments, but there's no exception for the use of chokeholds. And a lot of our major cities um, had already banned the use of chokeholds. Um, but of course, the penalty was disciplinary action, not necessarily uh, criminal or civil penalties. So that changes that. Um, but yes, we have, we have banned the use of chokeholds. Okay. Now I wanted to take one final minute to ask if anyone else had questions that they wanted to pose before I move on to sort of my last question for our presenters. Once, going twice. All right, perfect. So um, one of the things that I've heard from most states that have enacted legislation sort of in this unique uh, window, whether they were in session that was delayed or otherwise, um, and if they manage to enact legislation, it's been often referenced as a first step uh, with intentions to do more in the future. So my question to the two of you is, do you have plans for 2021 to address this issue again? And if so, what are those? Yeah, so um, this, is, this is just, I, I, it's, it's, it sucks to say it's a first step because I do know that there's legislators who've been working on this for so very long. Um, this is a big shift though, you know, um, and I think it is a big step forward for Colorado, but there is more work that needs to be done. We do need independent investigation and I believe that should needs to happen at the federal level because as you all know, I'm sure it's Colorado's no, not unique in this. Um, usually a DA knows the sheriff, knows the DA in the other county knows, I mean, everyone is, is so connected that it's hard to really make it independent. And so I do believe in, that we need more independence. Um, uh, there is a lot more that we need to do around um, psychiatric evaluations and ensuring folks have access to mental health care. Um, they need that and the community needs it. Um, and I will go and I will say publicly that I do support the divestment in, in, the poli in policing. COVID has shown us specifically that we can actually reduce the funding that we use for law enforcement and move it other places. We are not putting the same amount of people in jails and prisons right now. Right, we can't. There's no space, and we we don't want to keep. I'm sorry, some some of your some of your states maybe are doing a little different, but we're all trying to figure out how to make sure that there are space and that we can keep people safe in our correctional facilities, which means a lot of folks aren't coming in. Right, we're not we're not letting folks out early necessarily. Some people are, but we're not letting people in. That's important because there are other ways that we can affect public safety. In Denver, um, I started a program and funded it through, um, through a tax. So thanks to my friends in Seattle who gave me this idea to start a program from Eugene, Oregon called CAHOOTS. Um, we have a program now called STAR, where we are working with law enforcement and 911 to dispatch a mental health professional and an EMT as opposed to law enforcement on mental health scenes. The STAR program has been working for, um, since June, it's been working very effectively. The money does not go into the police department's budget. In fact, the police department has been helping and funding things like the insurance for the vans and things like that. They've been a great partner. They train together and they should. But we don't have to think about just increasing policing budget because we have seen an increase in the folks, in folks who need mental health or substance use services. In fact, we can shift funding over into those areas and save money in correction, save money in child welfare, you know, when we actually start to think about things differently. This too is a bipartisan issue. Um, the language might be very different and I, I'm aware of that, <clears throat> but the outcome could be the same, which is getting people the services they need so they're not cycling in and out of prison for the rest of their lives. Um, and so I'm looking forward to working with all of you. I put my cell phone in the chat as, long, as well as my email. Um, if you want to call me or chat about any of this or need connections or, or um, you know, stakeholders, whatever you need, please call me, please text me, um, please reach out to me, and I'd be happy to get back to any of you all with any questions. So thank you so much to NCSL for putting this meeting together, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Representative Herod. And then Representative Soper, if you just had uh, concluding remarks as well or next steps. Oh, thank you, Amber. You know, I have a, um, a law enforcement training uh, facility uh, in my district. Uh, it's actually a technical college, and they also do um, cosmetology. One thing I find really fascinating is that it takes twice as long to get your cosmetology license as it does to get your post-certification license. 
So one thing I'm interested in is actually um, either reducing cosmetology or actually ensuring that those individuals who do want to become post-certified, and it stands for Peace Officer Training and Standards, it's the certification to become a law enforcement officer, that if you're going to be carrying a firearm and, and arresting people, that's the state's police power. And that's denying citizens their, their liberty and their freedom. That should not be a few week long course. It should actually be um, something where you actually drill that in just how critical it is to get it right every single time. So that's something I'd be interested in looking at. The other thing I'm well aware of is uh, 217, the uh, you know, police reform bill we've been talking about, it changed a lot in Colorado. So I think we need to kind of see how it starts to play out because we're, we're constantly tweaking statutes. That's why they're called the revised statutes. I think every state has them called that or some variant. So I, I certainly know we're gonna have to be doing some tweaking, but I wanna see how it starts to play out actually in practice. So have a little bit of a wait and see. But I wanna thank you, Amber and NCSL for hosting this. and. To my colleague, Representative Leslie Herod, uh, this uh, is certainly a um, you know, major topic. It's uh, very timely. It's one that uh, we very rarely in Colorado get to say we were the first at, at much, and, and this was something we were the first at, so, so that's kind of cool as well. But I appreciate being able to have everyone here, and, and I'll also type my uh, email and phone number as well in the chat, but please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. And thank you, Representative Herod, for bringing up the STAR model and the CAHOOTS model. I also dropped in the chat a link to a new NCSL webpage that we just launched that describes the various uh, police mental health collaboration models that cover um, those new innovative, and I guess not new, Eugene, Oregon's been doing it for a long time, but some of those um, yeah. interesting and different types of alternative responses. So there's some additional information there. And as always, NCSL is happy to field um, questions from lawmakers or put you in touch with Representative Soper or Herod um, going forward. And I think I have just a couple minutes, so I am going to squeeze in one final question that came in, if you guys are okay with that. Uh, Delaware's chokehold bill, House Bill 350, had an exception that the use of a chokehold is only justifiable if the person reasonably believes that the use of deadly force is necessary to protect the life of the civilian or law enforcement officer. Um, which the question describes as feeling like an affirmative defense. And the person asking this question, uh, Anna, wanted to know what your thoughts were on this kind of limited exception for the chokehold regulation. Yeah, I, Anna, you're, you're right. I mean, basically it's unenforceable and it just allows law enforcement to get away with doing this. Um, there, is no, there is no reason you need to use a chokehold or a carotid hold. And I will tell you, uh, my father was the head of internal investigation for Supermax. Um, and he was a, he's a law enforcement officer, retired, but started at the age of 19 and then retired out of the federal system. And he agrees that we need to ban the use of chokeholds and that they are never necessary. So, um, so I believe this is a loophole. Uh, the reasonable reasonable belief argument is, we, we also changed that in Colorado statute. Um, so keep your eye peeled for these type of exemptions. It does make the, the clause unenforceable. Thank you for bringing that up. And I guess to just also add my two cents worth, I, you know, I think I'd want to see some research into that as well, that I, I just don't believe that if you had that type of exception that you, you would probably have the, um, you know, the rule becoming the exception. And so, yeah, I would probably agree with Representative Herod here that I just don't think that probably research would follow that. Well, thank you so much for those final comments, Representative Soper and Re Representative Herod. Um, we appreciate your time here today. And again, NCSL is happy to field any questions that you may have about the database or about the content that we have brought up on today's presentation. Um, thank you for your time and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Amber.
Thank you all. It was great. I guess I was unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to stop?